that's all doing in KDB. Um, if we have any technical questions on that at the end, then I will defer to Kira, who's been spending a lot more time on it than I have. Um, and then also the, the live fair price processing as well. So as the events come in, we have to know, we have to update the fair price for each of those players, um, whether it's a season long future, which is <coughs> the, through the entire season, or for that individual game. Uh, again, as Kira mentioned, we're only using 32 bit entirely. We're on 3.2. Um, and that, at the moment, hasn't caused us any issues, mainly because we haven't gone live yet, so we haven't got a massive amount of data. But um, assuming that we do really well, then maybe we'll run out of space. But um, that would be a good position to be in, I think. Um, plus, we've got ideas around splitting HDBs and things like that, where and splitting RDBs, similar to how we normally do it in a market data platform, it means we probably, we'll probably be OK. Um, just a couple other bits on, on the KDB side. Uh, the asynchronous gateway, we're using asynchronous gateways from day one, so um, what we've done is we have classified our functionality into sort of critical functionality, which is what, I've, what, we, what we call the trading gateway, i.e. placing orders, cancelling orders, posting margin, and then everything else that's not quite as critical we split into a separate gateway, which we call the unified gateway. So the reason for that is, is that the Java processes are multi-threaded, um, and because we want to make sure that if somebody places an order on the API, that doesn't get held up by somebody just wanting to view their order history for the past year. Um, so this is a way of, of getting around, obviously, the single-threadedness or nature of, of KDB. Um, on the administration side, we have a, a daemon. I think a lot of the, the frameworks now are out, out there have <coughs> this sort of functionality, so just a way of keeping track of all the processes, bringing them up, stopping them, and seeing what's going on in them. Um, pretty much, I'd say, I think is a reasonably standard thing these days. Um, and the other bit that we, that we do as well is obviously we, we, as the Java process, sorry by we, that's because that's what I'm working on at the moment, um, we subscribe to a ticker plan on the KDB side and those messages get picked up and then routed to the individual user by the user ID in the tables. So for example, you know, you've got 10 people's account balances have updated not everybody needs to know that those 10 account balances have changed. So we inspect the user ID and make sure that we route those updates to the right person, whichever web sockets they have open. So that all happens again on the Java side to make it keep the KDB lean and, and mean. Um, so I mean, the other thing that's of interest and I suppose a bit different about this entire project is that we are entirely cloud-based. We, we have no physical hardware at all, apart from this laptop. Um, and so this has brought a few challenges. It's also quite interesting. Um, the key thing here being that the FCA had a lot to say about the providers that we used for our product. And that limited us quite seriously to what we could use. So all the common things that you might think about using Amazon Web Services, GitHub, um, G uh, Google Apps, these were all not allowed by the FCA for us to use for our business. So we ended up with a... <coughs> Uh, private IAS provider called Sleepless, who are an Irish company, um, Office 365 for all of our office stuff, and then a company that provides hosted Git repos with 100% SLA, because um, what we realized is that GitHub and Bitbucket, for example, are a use-at-your-own-risk provider, even if you pay. So if they go down, they don't care, because that's their, that's their SLA, so we, we weren't allowed to use those guys. Now, we do try and use Amazon Web Services where we can because they're actually, it's a really, I think it's a really good set of products. Um, we tried Azure, Microsoft's version, and I didn't like it at all. Um, so where we can, we use Amazon Web Services for non-critical things. We use it for our, so for example, where we use it is our Okta feed handler logs rather than storing them on disk, and that disk can get full. We just upload them to Amazon. It's infinitely big, and you can define really good archiving rules that are a lot easier than doing something like log rotate. You can just be like, after a year, delete them, or after 10 years, delete them. And that way, you keep a, an eye on your costs. So in terms of how it looks in the cloud, I wanted to show this um, diagram. So we've got Amazon out of the way. We mainly use, if you've used Amazon Web Services, their S3 storage, which is just a big data dump of stuff, and their email service as well, which is SES, simple email service. But other than that, we, are, we reside entirely in Sleepless's 
virtual server farm in uh, in Ireland. Um, and you know, one of the challenges that I come on to at the end is is the fact that this is a public-facing website, and that gives for me it gives us a lot of headaches that up until now I haven't had to consider. I haven't had to consider security from a point of view of somebody trying to maliciously hack into the system or deliberately try and crash it or deliberately try and you know just piss us off you know it's it, these are all things that happen and if you read technology sites it happens all the time and it's a problem and we have to at least be vaguely aware of, of those issues now before we go live and hope that we don't get uh, completely wiped <laughs> off the face of the earth so what we do is is that we have our in the red is our internet facing services and in the green is all the private services that aren't directly accessible from the internet. Um, we use a product called HA Proxy, which is a, a reverse proxy, a bit like Nginx, if you know of that. I uh, highly recommend that product if you're doing this sort of stuff, because it's been really, really powerful. Um, and then otherwise, backwards from that, it's, it's pretty much a standard application, I'd say. You've got your Apache web server giving you your static data, and then Java, Java processes behind the scenes, and all KDB IPC between the KDB service and that. Um, you know, I'd say that's pretty pretty standard stuff, but yeah, from a security point of view, that's that's where it's um, providing me uh, a bit of stress at the moment. Good thing about HA Proxy, which might not be the case for Nginx as well, is um, WebSocket support. So it does WebSocket tunneling through it to the Web API. So it can dynamically load balance WebSocket <coughs> connections as well. Which is, which is quite cool. I, and could sit in front of KDB natively if you wanted to. Um, I, I'm not that brave, personally. Um, so obviously we're not doing this on our own. We have partners um, that we're relying on. Okta, as, I, as we've mentioned, providing all of our real-time data for the Premier League. Um, our, uh, we have a partnership with a company called Who Scored, which if you're into your football stats, you might have heard of. Um, Basically, we're going we're gonna to give a white label version of our product to them to, to, to run. Uh, and they're you know, a pretty big site. They have only over 1.5 million unique users a month. So it's going to be a, hopefully we can get some of those guys to sign up and it'll be a big test of our system. Um, we also have a an external market maker to take some of that risk for, away from us. And the matching engine, which you know, Kieran and, and his guys helped us write, we've also managed to license to a US startup as well. So there is interest in the technology from a KDB point of view as well as the application as a whole. <coughs> so um, what does it look like? At the moment, I I'm not feeling brave enough to do a demo in front of you all. Um, so instead, we're going to have a couple of pictures. Um, so this is what it looks like at the moment, very near. Um, we're in the process of, of implementing this design. We had a separate design before that was all very table-based. And instead, what we've tried to do is Show you know show the data in an easy to understand way. I think you know if anyone who's worked on KDB systems knows you've got a lot of data, but it's really hard to show it to users in a nice way. Um, so we've had our graphic designer um, come up with these sort of designs to try and make the data easy to view and also easy to see what what you're going to be doing as well, or what you need to do with the system to actually progress through it. Um, so on the left, just to go through it, we've got the players. <coughs> who are available to trade. We have, you know, who they play for. They, this, is, this is their team colours <coughs> here, which I'm not really sure um, is the greatest icon. Um, so then you can decide whether to buy or sell. You've got your trade slip here, which gives you all of your buys and sells. You click confirm, and then that goes away, and you've hopefully, assuming there's somebody on the other side, uh, you can, th those trades will go in and they'll be filled. Um, separately to that as well is, you know, we want in-depth stats to be easily available. So this is what we're trying to do around individual players. So <clears throat> you've got graphs here which are trying to show, OK, their, ma their market price throughout the season, or their fair price, or their averages, um, as well as the order book, which is the line above. So you've got the top th the level three of the, the order depth in the in this application at the moment. And then some simple stats at the top to try and show people, you know, do they, you know, do they agree with the way that they think the fair price is going to go up and down from two pound and up, and that's how they make their decision on whether to buy or sell? Um, so that's a very quick look at the site, by the way, and, and obviously we'll be going live in August time when you know will be open. 
and available for anybody to sign up. Um, so just a few challenges that I think, you know, I, I've mentioned the middle one already. This is a public facing a a application and um, all of this stuff is, is a concern. We're obviously doing everything over SSL, um, including secure web sockets. So that's um, something that was a bit new for me. I, again, working internally to <coughs> an organization generally, you're not worried about encrypting the data in flow. You just send it however you want. Uh, denial of service and API abuse. Also, you know, if you heard in the news, last passes, password system got compromised. I'm not saying ours is anywhere near as good as that. So that's always a risk around these sort of sites. Um, <coughs> come back to the first one, you know, the FCA we've mentioned a few times. You know, the FCA application process is not made for a company of two people. It's made for Deutsche Bank or Total, big companies that have a lot of people to throw into this. I mean, this has been a massive, a massive struggle, but we got there uh, and we are approved. Like I say, the, the biggest issue for us, for, for me, a CTO, technical guy from the technical aspect is that they are very, very fussy on the technology providers you use and that's limited us to some extent as to exactly the technology we wanted to use. You know, it's either that or we don't get regulated and we don't go into business. So um, that, was, that was difficult. Um, another one that I thought about, you know, we're starting with nothing. Everywhere I've gone into, every other company I've worked at, they've had a bunch of servers, they've had networks set up, they've had user accounts just available to me. We don't have any of that. So, you know, we had to start not just building the application, but also building the company's application infrastructure. Okay, it's virtual, but we still need that. We still need networking and we still need user access. Uh, so that was, you know, fun, a bit different. Um, and, you know, working with the KDB plus Java interface, that is not quite as mean as it sounds. Um, for guys that we have coming in that don't have any KDB experience, we need a way of them being able to work with our KDB API, but not have to worry about actually learning KDB to use C.java, which personally I think you need to, because it's terrible from a Java point of view. That's, that's my personal opinion. So we've had to work to try and abstract that away as much as we can. So it's a lot, in theory, you know, people might disagree that it's easier to use because, and we don't need to train guy, every person that comes through the door uh, on KDB, particularly if they're contracting for a short period of time, we need them to be developing Java. We don't need them to be learning um, how to interface with, with KDB. And, and another one at the bottom there, it's, it, it sounds a bit silly really, but you know, in a big organisation, you don't really think about the money in terms of, you know, it's, it's not, you know, a guy down the road who's putting a tenner. If we get his, the fair price calculation wrong and he loses two quid, it's, it's not going to cause the next credit crunch, but it's, it's, it feels a lot more personal in that time of view, rather than in a big organisation where we're talking about billions and millions of pounds. For me, this in some ways feels more, more scary to deal with your man on, your street, on the streets money. But um, maybe that's because I wasn't uh, appreciative of the the volumes of money that were going on in, in the other places I worked. So, timelines. We're still on. We're still develop. We're still developing. Um, we're going through the second iteration of the design to try and remove just list, just tables everywhere of data and try and visualise the data a lot better to try and help users who aren't experienced in what the data means to not be overwhelmed and not want to and not understand what they need to do. And we've got other things as well, I think I mentioned already, like fraud checking. When users sign up, we have to make sure they're not money laundering and we have to make sure they're not, um, who they, you know, they're not who they say they are. We have to validate that they are that person. And also things around marketing and referral schemes as well to try and get people to actually use the thing. Um, so by July, we're hoping to be feature complete and into some like, sort of closed beta test. Um, people, who, if you've been to the Boer book site already, if you've heard about it before, there is a uh, an email address field that you can fill in. We'll, we'll probably be getting in touch with some of those people in July to help us out with, with the testing. And then August, we want to be live for the new Premier League season. Uh, so finally, we are looking for people. Um, permanent people, really, not, not contractors so much. Um, so if you are interested in the product and want to chat to us, then please do. Me, myself, and the CEO, John Keyes, is, is here as well. Um, and we'd, we'd love to talk to you and tell you any more that you have, uh, any more, any other questions you have about it, and um, yeah, get in touch. So that's me. Um, does anybody have any questions?
you doing a sort of staged um, release for, to see what falls over when uh, you know, so it's a partial release to, to play with? How do you? So, so the site is actually up all the time. Oh. It's just not on the main URL. So we have a public-facing site that we all test because um, because we're sort of in the cloud. We don't really have an internal network, so we all work sort of from the outside in. So um, it is there, um, and it goes up and down as the, our web guy makes changes. So it, it's always there, and as issues come up, we raise them to sort of sort of that continuous <coughs> testing. Uh, I suppose I was, more, I was more thinking of trying to get some limited exposure to people who are going to hack it. And, you know, yeah, so as part of the FCA regulation, we've had to go through mandatory penetration testing, um, which actually threw up some really good things to do. I, we, I don't think we would have done it unless they'd required it, and I'm glad that we did. Um, things like, you know, um, sensitive user information and URLs and things like that, and uh, cross-site scripting attacks and all that stuff to try and they, all those things have to be fixed before the penetration testing guys will say, yeah, this is secure. Um, all the SSL requirements are there as well, so you've got to protect from all those hacks that are around at the moment, around SSL like Poodle and uh, Beast or whatever the other ones are. So, yeah, that was the way that we actually um, got around those problems was, was through that testing. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, are you going to have like a play money version of it? Oh, what, sorry? Play money version. Yeah, yeah, so um, that is something that we're thinking of doing. So it'll probably be something like demo.boobook.com, but yeah, you, you can sign up there and, yes. and you'll get like a thousand Boobook pounds rather than British pounds, and then you can play around with it and understand the site because I think it's, it's an issue, you know, it's not 100% clear maybe from day one for a lot of people, so we want to let, let people try it and see if they understand it and see if, you know, like the spread betting companies do, you can play around and go from there. So that's something that we're definitely looking to do. Can I talk a little bit about how you're scaling with KDB side things? KDB being a single thread out of the box and being able to roll with thousands of people hitting it at yeah. the same time. How are you scaling it in this environment? So, it's not, it, obviously it is single threaded, but you know, I think as, as a lot of us know in the room, it, it's, it can deal with high throughput, I would say, more so than something like a Java uh, version of, of anything could. Um, now, I don't have the numbers on how many orders, for example, our matching engine can cope with, but the way that it works internally is, I'm using the matching engine as an example, each player is a separate market. So, and then each market has two products. It's the game length future and the season length future. So at the moment, that's in one matching engine. But I believe there is, we could, if we needed to, um, split those out. If you know, if you're getting balancing issues where one player is being traded a million times and everybody else is only being traded four times, you, you could load balance that way and then just split them up. Go, and then we've got the async gateways as well, in theory, to try and help with that performance, those performance issues as well. Um, I mean, to be honest, a lot of it is that we haven't really considered it because we haven't come anywhere near the lows that we would need to to, to split those out. But like I say, if, if, if the site kicks off in a big way, those things are going to become very urgent to deal with. Um, and we'll be in a really good place if, if, if that actually becomes a problem. Sure. Uh, as much as I love KDB, isn't a matching engine like one of the worst things you can do in KDB? So yeah. that gets right. It is the one of the first things you can do. No, worst, like a oh, worst. It's a very <laughs> atomic process, like dealing with small amounts of data and inserting and trying to keep things sorted, and that's KDB. Like, yeah, I think would struggle. So I'm just trying to understand why exactly that piece is in KDB. So this, I, I, I think this. Probably take that. Go on. Uh, so I, I would, I would probably agree with you, uh, mostly that you know there's a lot of scalar operations. In, in, in matching engines in general, and I'm sure if you did it in C plus C or C plus plus, you would get higher performance. Like I wouldn't dispute that at all. But with the volumes that we're projecting on this exchange, even if it hugely blows up, we'll still be very comfortable. Uh, we have because done every, sorry, because every player is a separate matching engine. Um, even at the moment, with all, with all the players in the one matching engine, we would have to completely balloon in the first year for us to, to, to get into trouble. And then, yes, as Jazz said, we could parallelize and just totally split up by exchange or by, or by uh, order type. So yes, it's, it's, it's true that KDB is, is in its comfort zone when it's dealing with large vector operations. And trading in general is, is something I've seen in my own experience at, say, Bank of America. They, 
they had a, kind of their trading in KDB and they moved into C++. But I guess just because of the ease of use and, and the, the turnaround time, and I guess it's, it's working very well for us, so. I think honestly, a lot of it is to do with the fact that we both know KDB. We, we know KDB, so it seemed better, a better idea than doing it in Java, which is the other language I knew. So um, I think that's why, I think that's why <laughs> we made that decision. Yeah. Uh, as well as uh, all those po positive benefits. Yeah, it, it has bit pros and cons, and yeah, we're, we're happy enough with the choice so far. Sure. How big is the data that we're talking about? It seems to me um, it's somehow overkill because um, the data in Boa book or in game trading is not that high frequency or not that large, isn't it? There's some number for me. And are you using the 64 bit or are you using the 32? So we're only using 32 bit exclusively. Okay. We, we haven't bought the license. Um, around the volumes, though, I think the, where this is going to show it is during the games, the volumes are going to be very high. And then obviously, at other times, they're going to be very, very small. Um, the amount of, say, the amount of orders and people checking their stats. I think, I think that's how it's going to work. Um, but the data volumes aren't very big. They're, I wouldn't say they're even close to, uh, not even close to gigabytes yet. I would say. Yeah, well, the opta data is very small. Each player might have seventy or eighty records a game, but I guess. It's hard to predict, to predict how big the, the trading data will be because obviously that depends on the number of users we have. But where KDB is very useful is for, like, you know, as you see in the front end, you can see the stats, and we have quite <coughs> detailed stats per player. You want to see how many goals he scored against this team at this event. And KDB is very, very good for that, for doing aggregations and, and summaries and rolling up the data and stuff. So, yeah. I wouldn't say it's overkill because uh, the, the volumes can, they could feasibly get very big, and with the amount of data crunching we're doing, KDB is, is ideal in my own view for it. Um, as it might not be the, the best technology to use for matching engines in general, but all in all, I think it, it's a good choice. Um, and obviously, coming from a, a finance background and a KDB background, I'm heavily biased in favor of KDB. But yeah. Cool. Sure. Does your matching uh, deal with any qualitative information? How do you mean? For example, okay, it's a bit offside here. Uh, for example, a player may be habitually putting funny things into his nose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or there are a dozen women chasing him for paternity. Yeah, I know what you mean. So, no, so. So the matching engine has no concept of um, how the player is actually performing. The orders that come in are based entirely on what the users want to do. So the fair price value is, during the season, is indicative until the end of the season where that's the value of the player. So throughout the season, you know, if it says the fair price is three pounds, but you reckon he's going to have a blind, you know, he's going to have a cracking end, end of the season, you think he's going to be worth fifteen pounds, you'll try and buy him at fifteen oh, pounds. Okay. Just the perception of the market. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry to cut it short, but I think we're on a pretty tight yeah. schedule with four presenters, so I'll move along. I'll stop I think, um, <coughs> okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Jess.